Uh, my name is Bill Starr. I'm the director of the Georgia Center for the Book. We are hosts for this and a series of programs throughout the year, and we are delighted to have you with us tonight, particularly so because we are celebrating a wonderful Atlanta writer, Jack Riggs, tonight. Jack Riggs, who is uh, and has been for some time a very special friend of ours. In recent years, he's worked with the Center for the Book on a great many projects, and he's helped us present programs at his school, Georgia Perimeter College. Several years ago, we invited Jack to come over here and speak to the awards ceremony for our winners at our annual Letters About Literature statewide student competition. Jack was terrific. He wowed the kids, um, so much so that we have made him come back every year since to deliver a talk. So, of course, when we invited him to come to this program tonight, the first thing he wanted to know was whether or not we would have any adults in the audience. Jack, I hope you are satisfied tonight we have done that. Jack is really one of the literary gems that makes Atlanta shine so brightly. He's a wonderful teacher, a mentor, and a writer in residence at Georgia Perimeter College, and I hope they appreciate what an extraordinary gifted writer they have. Um, his first novel, When the Finch Rises, won him the Georgia Author of the Year Award in 2003, and now he's finished his second novel, a marvelous book called The Fireman's Wife. Don't be surprised if he wins more awards for that. The new novel is a very emotional book. Jack makes no apologies for that. It focuses on a troubled marriage and difficult decisions a wife and mother has to make. It would have been very easy to turn it into melodrama, but it is not. Instead, when you read it, you will find yourself caught up with characters who are real and complex, with deep shadings of right and wrong, love and forgiveness. It is in many ways a sad spare novel, but it is a very moving novel and one that Terry Kay says, a story that you will happily share with your friends. The book also has something extra special about it. It comes with a reader's guide at the end and also a very delightful and revealing interview with Jack conducted by another wonderful writer named Connie Mae Fowler. It makes a sensational bonus for readers and it will tell you uh, more about the novel as well as more about Jack. So another reason to be sure to go out and buy your copy and get it autographed before you leave tonight. And enough of me. Let us hear from the man of the hour himself. Please join me in a special welcome for Jack Riggs. Thank you all for coming tonight. I know a lot of you are here because of um, an email program that my wife is putting together, an email list that my wife is putting together. I promise you we won't be spamming you all the time with stuff like, Jack Riggs sold 12 books today, <laughs> please buy more or anything like that. But I do thank you all for coming. It's been a, it's been a long time. It's been a long time coming to get to this point where I have this new book out, and uh, it, it hasn't it hasn't been an easy road. Uh, it's if someone would have told me five years ago after uh, Finch came out that it would be five years before I had an, a new book out, I w wouldn't have believed them. Uh, and so it, it's just the way it works. And certainly in this day and age, it's um, you know, we're lucky that there's still books being published, and we're lucky that we have folks like you who still come out to hear readings and, and what have you. Uh, I've been thinking about tonight a lot, <coughs> trying to figure out what I was going to read, because every time I've read from this book as a manuscript, every time, everything I read I ended up taking out of the book. <laughs> so I, I, it, it bothered me. I worried a little bit about reading this from the book. I was afraid maybe um, I would wake up in the morning and that page would disappear. Uh, and, and a couple of years ago, I wrote a song about the book. Uh, I, I got tired of reading from Finch, and I got tired of, of editing out the pieces that I would read when I would go to book reading or festivals and stuff. And so I, I, I wrote a song, and, and I thought I could bring my guitar and, and sing to you tonight and play that song, but... Uh, 
the song actually tells you exactly what's in the book. And if I sang it, then you would know what was in the book and how it ended. And so you wouldn't buy the book. And Frank would be very upset out there because he's brought these books. And then I forgot to bring my guitar, so that sort of put it into that. And then I started thinking about, you know, hard economic times. And, and I thought, well, you know, we need to think about this. It's hard, you know, even buying a book is, is difficult. And so, you know, I thought maybe I could read the whole book here. <laughs> I, I have all of you here. It's, it feels like the Low Country in July. And, and, and maybe it would be fun for me to just read the whole book. And then, and then I thought Frank would really be pissed at me if I did that. So then I, start, I kept thinking, you know, I was thinking way too much. And I thought, well, it, you know, we need to be good consumers in this day and age. So, you know, we got to know what we need. We want to buy the right things. And so I thought I could maybe read the last chapter. And if you felt good about the last chapter, <laughs> then you would buy something you felt you needed to have. And, and then I thought, if you read the last chapter, or if I read the last chapter, it's not a feel-good chapter. So you're not going to feel good, and then you're not going to buy the book. And Frank's going to be more mad at me. So then I thought maybe I could like uh, memorize a passage and just like recite it to you. And I thought that would be really cool because then it would look like I really knew what I was writing about and I understood the book and, and it would look really good. And so I tried to do that and all I could, all I could remember from the book was the last word. <laughs> and, and it doesn't, you see, here, here it goes. The last word in the book is, Home. Thank you. Uh, home. It, it, it just doesn't. It doesn't tell you enough. It doesn't. It, it doesn't reveal enough about the book. And you know, finally, I just sort of figured out maybe what we should all do is just go to the brick store and get a beer <laughs> and, and cool off on the way over. I, I wrote. I wrote this book not out of love to start with. This book was written out of necessity to start with. Uh, my second novel had been rejected by Ballantyne. Um, and I was pretty much, uh, you know, I was ready to kick a dog on every street corner that I could find uh, when that happened. And I happened to be down at the, the beach. I was going to take this novel that had been rejected. I couldn't understand the rejection. And uh, still don't understand it, but um, you know, I, I was going to take that novel and I was going to deconstruct it. I was going to pull it apart, and I was going to find the right, the right story in there and keep working on it. Um, when I got a, a phone call from my my agent, who asked me if I had anything else that Valentine wanted to know, what else? I didn't know that I still had a publisher at that point. I figured if they if they uh, rejected it, then I was done. So um, I was down there, and I, I didn't have anything else that I was working on. And uh, this place that I ride at at the beach, right beside it is a fire station. And also, I, I had Larry Brown's On Fire with me down there. And I've been rereading that, because I certainly felt like I was on fire. And it was a good book to read. And I, I loved Larry Brown, and I loved his fire stories. And I was reading that book, and I'd been talking to my agent. and. This fire truck went out about the time I had her on the phone, and she said, well, do you have anything? And I said, well, I'm writing a book about a fireman. <laughs> and she said, okay, that's a good, that's kind of a good topic. And I said, give me a week, and I'll have something for you. <laughs> so I, I, I took my partly deconstructed novel, and I put it to the side, and, and, and I started writing uh, one of those things, one of those pieces that I've read before that never made it into the book uh, that my son Chris loves me to always mention because it's about a, a young little towhead boy drowning at the beach and he always thinks that I'm writing it about him. <laughs> Sometimes I thought it might be a pretty good idea to write that. <laughs> uh, and so that began and it really began, be, be, it began as a labor of necessity. And it probably remained that until I was up in the mountains. And this is a book about Cassie 
and, and Peck Johnson. And Peck is a fireman. And Cassie is his wife, thus the fireman's wife. And uh, Cassie is from the mountains, the North Carolina uh, mountains around Cashers and Highlands. And I, I knew the beach really well because, you know, I spent a lot of time at the beach. But I didn't really know the mountains. I, we have a group of friends that, that always end up in the mountains at th around Thanksgiving, and we do a lot of hiking around there. And this particular uh, area, I, I just love it, the Whiteside Mountain um, uh, that, that whole area right around Highlands is so beautiful and spectacular. And we're always up there in, in Thanksgiving, and it's, it's you know, the, the vistas are magnificent. And I really like that, liked that idea, but I didn't really know. Thus, I was having a really difficult time with Cassie's character. So I went up and I spent some time up there researching, walked the land, found some folks, uh, homegrown folks, actually, from Highlands, who I befriended, and they took me out, and, and they allowed me to walk land, and they, get, they spent a lot of time with me. And I came to understand Cassie during that time that I was in the mountains. And once I came to understand who she was, then the, the novel changed. And it became really a, a, a novel of love uh, for me and my characters. And, and without that time in the mountains, I don't think I would have written the book. I don't think it would have been uh, concluded. Um, so having sort of prefaced you on all that, what I'd like to do tonight is, is read uh, since it's, it's alternating points of view, uh, Peck and Cassie chapters. And so I'm going to read a little bit uh, from both chapters so you can get a, a feel for the whole novel um, through uh, the characters and, and, and some of the, the incidences that, that go on. Um, Peck is the, uh, he is the newly crowned chief of the, uh, of the station, the fire station at Garden City Beach. It's a fledgling station. It's kind of an outpost. Uh, 1970, at the, end of, at the end of the Myrtle Beach Strand, uh, Garden City Beach. And it's a mile from Merrill's Inlet, if you're familiar with that. It's a great seafood place, but it's also this fantastic marsh, the Mer uh, Merrill's Inlet Marsh, uh, that uh, is, is there. And, and the place that we stay, the place I write, is right uh, on the marsh. The sun sets across the marsh, and so it's a spectacular view every day that we're there. Um, so they are lit... Peck is from the low country of South Carolina. Cassie is from the mountains. And Cassie has had to move. Uh, she's lived in the, on the low, in the low country along the marsh for 15 years, having become pregnant when she was 18 years old um, and uh, kicked out of her family's home in the mountains, uh, married Peck, moved to the beach, and she's lived there. And she's always been sort of a fish out of water down there, uh, as Peck is a fish out of water or a bear out of the mountains, if you will. Uh, so they both have conflict with each other's geography of the landscape. Uh, at the same time, uh, they both understand how the other is drawn to their home. So at the beginning of the novel, Cassie is leaving Peck after 15 years. It's 1970. There's sort of a hint of, of all the, you know, the, the social turmoil that's going on, the fact that uh, in the, you know, around 1970, the beginning of uh, the feminist movement and uh, and what have you. And so Cassie is beginning to sort of stretch her legs and, and desiring to go back to, what, to, to, to finish what she had started, which was um, she was planning to go to college at Western Carolina in Cullowhee. And she had, uh, she had actually uh, begun school when she was uh, having her morning sickness, and so she had to drop out, and she never completed her education. So she's having some some great conflicts with that. Peck, on the other hand, who understands uh, Cassie's conflict to some degree, is a fireman and his job. This is the, this is the tough season down there. Uh, this is the tourist season, and it's crazy on them. And so he's fully consumed with his job, knowing that if he loses contact, if he, if he fails to sort of keep himself focused, that there's danger lurking for him and his, and his firemen. And so he's always very conscious of, uh, of that, too conscious to, to some degree. And Cassie is, is straying away. So the first uh, part I'm going to read to you is, um, is in the midst of Cassie fleeing. Uh, a couple of characters to know. Cassie and uh, Kelly are mother and daughter. Uh, Clay Taylor is the man, uh, a fireman, that Cassie is running away with. Clay has uh, been given a, has been hired as the, a new chief uh, in Walhalla, South Carolina, and so he's on his way to Walhalla. Um, 
And it's kind of early, prematurely, uh, in, the, in that uh, uh, Peck has told uh, the folks down at, you know, his folks down in the, at, in the low country to get rid of him. He's, he doesn't need to stay. Let him go be a chief. And so, because uh, Peck's aware uh, somewhat of the possibility of a relationship here. So uh, Clay is with Cassie and Kelly. Um, they saw this opportunity to have left early. Uh, Kelly is completely against this. She's 15 years old. She knows what's going on without being told, and she is pissed. Um, and she has had to. She's been offered. Kelly is this. Kelly's a phenom at playing softball, and she's a sophomore, and she's playing on the varsity team, and she's great. And she has had the option. She was the beginning of the novel. She's pl she plays in this all-star game, uh, and from that all-star game, she's given the opportunity to go up, ironically enough, to Western Carolina to a camp um, for college prospective students. Already, she's that good, and so. Uh, Cassie and, and Clay see this as an opportunity to leave early, and so Cassie has left, leaving only a note of one sentence, which is, I will call you later. And um, they had been battling uh, for the first couple of chapters on this road to Walhalla, and we're going to pick it up uh, toward the end of the day when they finally get up there. And the first place they're going, Clay's been looking for this They've been trying to find this um, this station in Walhalla. You know, Clay won't ask directions. <laughs> <clears throat> See, I almost told you the whole novel as it is. <laughs> if we could just get some some low country boiling here with the temperature. Oh, and by the way, there's a seven month drought that that in that plays throughout this novel too. I thought that was just appropriate last summer when I was writing. <laughs> We pull into the station, Clay's truck and the boat, and then me and Kelly. When he, me, when he comes over to the window, I put my arms on the door, lean out and smile. Hey, Chief, where's the fire? I say. But he's all business. I need to check in, see how the crew's doing, let them know I'm here. Okay, you want us to, to wait? I'd rather keep going, Kelly says. We still have an hour and a half to Meemaw's. Clay looks at me hard. Haven't you two talked? About what, Kelly says. About tonight. He looks at Kelly like he's daring her to keep it up. You're not going any further. You're staying here tonight. Kelly looks out the window. At the fire station? No, Clay says. You're staying with me. Kelly says, no, I'm not. I'll talk to her, Clay. Just go on over and see your fireman. But he doesn't leave. He eyes Kelly, waiting for her to turn to look back, but she won't. She stares out her window, cheek sucked in, defiant. Go, I say. I can feel the car shake when he pushes himself off the door to turn and walk away. I look at my daughter. She is unhappy again, not again now as she was when we left. The radio is on, the volume too loud for us sitting here without the wind blowing into the car, so I turn it off. I kill the engine, too, and then we are surrounded by uncomfortable silence. In her eyes, I see something I have never seen before. There is hatred staring at me, a hatred I don't know how to answer. It sends a cold chill through the center of my body. Clay is talking to the fireman over at the open door, a couple are sitting, two or three standing around him. He scuffs at the ground, motions back, but it's not to point to us. It's about his boat. I can hear that. The men nod and then shake their heads, point in a direction that's up the road. On up there, one of them says, about five miles. One man comes from inside the station with a piece of paper, hands it to Clay and then points in the same direction, his hands and arms weaving in the night air like he's trying to draw a map. Clay nods, look back at his boat and then to us with a slight wave. I hear one of the men ask how his wife and daughter are doing how they fared on the long trip and all. Wife and daughter, Kelly says. My God, Mama. She slumps hard in her seat, feet against the dashboard. Hush, I tell her. They don't know any better. It's just a mistake. Don't say anything about that. When he's finished, he shakes hands around and walks back over to my window while slipping the folded paper in his shirt pocket. He lights a cigarette, takes a long draw before bending into the window. Got a little more to go, he says. Where, I ask. 
He can tell I don't want to drive anymore. It's, a, it's been a long day. Just up the road, it's a new station they're opening. It won't be down here. I can tell this disappoints him. He, seems more, he seemed more excited when we first pulled up to the brightly lit firehouse, the chief's car all polished and parked out front. I can take the two of you over to the house first, he says, and I'll go drop off the boat. No, that's all right, I say. We've come this far. He smiles, glances over at Kelly, and then walks back to his truck, flicking the cigarette into the darkness. The rest of the ride is up a winding, unlit road, treacherous when, I, when I'm this tired. Kelly is sitting up, keeping an eye out, keeping tabs on Clay, who's driving too fast for us to follow. Where's he going, she asks, breaking the silence between us. To his station, I say, but I have my doubt. I think he's lost again. When we catch up, Clay is pulling into a small gravel parking lot. My headlights sweep across a building, an unpainted cinder block garage with no fire engine inside. The place seems abandoned in the night. We make a small donut turn and wait for Clay to back his boat in against the far side of the building. The trees rise around us, a black wall that feels warm and comforting. We are past the foothills now. Cicadas and tree frogs fill the cool air, and somewhere off in the distance I hear a small stream running down along the roadside. I am on the cusp of being home, and think maybe Kelly is right that we should just keep on going, push higher into the mountains until we are beyond South Carolina and back home in Whiteside Cove. Clay comes toward the car, his dark figure moving away from the building like a prowler who has failed to find a way inside. Where are they, I ask. Yeah, it's volunteer until Monday, he says. Then I'll have a crew. Two of the firemen I was talking to will end up up here with me later. Later there'll be more. It's a long way from Wahala, I say. It's only five miles, but it takes a while to get up here with the roads. He acts for a moment like he's unsure what to do next, like maybe he's made a mistake in taking this job. It makes my stomach sink to see it, a feeling of disappointment flushing hot across my face. You okay? I ask, my voice pulling Clay back. Sure, he says. He smiles, looks around like he's sizing up the possibilities. This is going to be great. He looks out over the top of the Bel Air, then leans into the window, points with his hand up the road that disappears quickly into the black night. See that right there? It goes to the, high, it goes to high, the highlands, he says. You take that then head on down 106 past Scaly Mountain until you hit 441 toward Clayton. You get that far and you're almost to Tallulah Gorge where they're building that rope walk for Walinda right now. He smiles at both of us, but I think we're just too tired to care. Let's get going, I say. If I don't get something to eat soon, I might not never make it to Tallulah Gorge. I can see Clay's disappointment that we don't play along, so I smile, try to be more reassuring. Look, why don't we just get some dinner at that cafeteria, maybe some ice cream afterward. Then he smiles, his spirits raised. Back in Walhalla, our luck keeps running out. The cafeteria is closed, the wrecks all too. There's no place to eat this late on a Saturday night except a small roadhouse all the way back down in Westminster. Retracing our steps makes me feel I'm losing ground, falling further away from where I want to be. By the time we have eaten, and found the house that Clay has rented. It's midnight. Kelly is asleep in the car. When I try to wake her, she calls out for Mima in a small voice. No, honey, I say, we aren't there yet. We'll go tomorrow. And then she remembers about Walhalla and refuses to move. It's not worth the fight to pull her out of the car and drag her into the small house. Stay in the car, I say. I don't care. I slam the door and leave her, forgetting to lock the car until I hear her pushing the buttons down. This has been the worst day of my life, she yells through the closed door. I hate you. I hate you more than anything in the world. What do we do to our children in this life? If I could change it all in a moment, I would. If I could walk over and tell Kelly that everything will be all right, I would, but I can't. I'm just as scared as she is, and I have no idea how all of this will turn out, but I won't stop now, I can't. I've come too far, even if I fail, to give up trying. Inside the house smells of spoiled summer heat. There's no air conditioning, but the nights here are not as hot as in Garden City Beach, and a breeze slips through the raised windows. 
The carpet is worn through in places. The walls need a good coat of paint, cobwebs shadowing the corners along the ceiling. The kitchen is tiny, the linoleum peeling on the floor, the pine cabinets dark and oily to the touch. Seems the chief of a firehouse could live a little higher than this, I say, sorry as soon as the words escape my mouth. I'll do better once I get settled in, Clay says. He looks out at my car where Kelly has grown silent, the windows beginning to whiten on the inside. Think she'll be there in the morning? She has no idea where she is, I say, so I imagine she'll just stay put. Want me to go out there and say something? No. Let her stew. Maybe a night in a car will do her some good, the hard head. He watches her for a minute more, then draws the shade while I make the bed where we will sleep tonight. I won't lock the door, he says, just in case she changes her mind. Thank you, that's kind, I tell him, but you don't need to be on her side. It's not her side I'm on, Cassie. It's ours. I know he wants me to say something, give some kind of reassurance about what we are doing, but I can't. I just find my nightgown and toothbrush and then head to the bathroom to get ready for sleep. By the time we are in bed together, it is after one Sunday morning, and I am thinking about Peck, wondering if he knows by now that I have left him for good. I did not say that in my note, just a quick line to tell him I would call, but if he looks around, he will see things are missing. It is the first time that I will spend a whole night completely with Clay. In the past, it has been only stolen afternoons or evenings at the house when Kelly was out or asleep, short hours together that never had the sense of permanence that this night carries. It is more uneasy than I imagined it would be. The fight that has raged all day with Kelly has taken something away from the moment, and I can't summon the strength to bring it back. In the past, just being with Clay, even if it was only an hour or two, was easy. I didn't have to think about what I was doing. I was desperate to just be there, and my reward was always a renewed strength to continue, a strength that I had thought I would find here tenfold tonight. Instead, I am exhausted. My daughter is angry and alone in a car, and Clay is beside me, waiting as I struggle to decide if I should turn to him. It's the beginning of our life together, he says quietly. I can feel his fingers trace my spine, the way he lets his hand settle on my hip. He smells of heat and tobacco. I know, I say. It's taken a lot out of me to get here. I hope you don't. Shh, he says, his mouth close to my ear as he pushes up next to me. He drapes, uh, his arm drapes over my side, holds me close. I stare at a dark wall, relieved he will let me be. Pray he won't sense my sudden disappointment in all of this, or that I am thinking I should be sleeping with Kelly rather than in here next to him. So you can see that Cassie is a conflicted woman. <laughs> the grass ain't greener on the other side. Though. So and you know, writing Cassie was, is tough because it's a, it's a tough. She's a tough character, and, and she's harsh and hard, uh, but she's a good person, and, and I love her. And she's really struggling, and what I'm trying to capture is that struggle. Now uh, I wanted to read um, a piece of Peck, <laughs> piece of Peck, a Peck of Peck. Um, Peck. Uh, the, just to set this up quickly, uh, this is Peck's birthday party. He's just turned 35 years old. And it happens on a day, on Wednesday, uh, at the beach. And Wednesday is known as Hump Day. And uh, it's a day at the beach where the, the crowd, uh, you know, the beach crowd comes in and they party and they get crazy and they kill themselves until Wednesday and then everybody dies for a day. And then they come back and finish out the week and go home. At least that's what I do, so I figured everybody does it. So th this, this begins on, on hump day. And, and just to give you a, a, a taste of that, here is what um, um, let's see. Oh, here. The, the, uh, just this little, little bit here to give you an idea of how Peck sees Wednesdays. Wednesday dawns slow and easy along the strand. 
People who have come down for vacations have by now exhausted themselves. They arrive on Saturday or Sunday and immediately start trying to kill themselves, drinking on the beach, drinking and burning their skin, drinking and swimming in the ocean, drinking and driving to seafood restaurants from Merle's Inlet and up north to Calabash. This occurs like a habit every week, the exhaustion taken over like someone set an alarm to go off inside their bodies. By Wednesday, they're moving slow and only far enough to breakfast to eat breakfast at a pancake house or get donuts and coffee at a Krispy Kreme. They stay inside nursing hangovers and blistered, and blistered sunburns or head into one of the arcades to play skee ball. They fill up putt-putt courses in the late afternoon or take in a movie, making it easier on the rest of us, the people who live here year-round. We call it hump day, the best day of the week, and I'm happy to be sitting in a rocking chair outside the station with my first cup of coffee from a fresh pot Lori made as soon as she got in this morning. Hump day, she says when she brings me my three packets of sugar. Yep, I say smiling, best damn day of the week. You got that right, Parti says. He pulls up a chair to sit next to me, takes one of my sugars before I can dump them all in my cup, but that's okay. So that's the hump day. That's what hump day is. And um, then we have, I want to read a, a, a bit of um, the chapter that is his birthday. What did I do with it? You know what? It, it may just be gone. Uh, oh my gosh, that's what happened. No, here we go. That's right here. I got all these pages marked. This is my first reading, so I don't have anything really marked well, but uh, here we go. So this, uh, a couple of other things just for you to know, uh, some characters. Uh, Teddy is um, a lifelong friend of Peck's, and he, uh, he's a police officer who likes to drink a lot. So uh, that's kind of crazy. Uh, Lori is the, uh, the, is the um, so the, the dispatcher uh, for the station. She's young, and um, she's a looker, I guess. You got J.D., who's a rookie fireman, uh, and Peck is sort of taking him under his wings. He's, uh, he's the first EMT on the force. 1970, EMTs were just starting to become uh, part of the fireman force, and so he's one of these guys that's, um, that's there as... Um, as a first EMT, and he's got, kind of got a special place uh, with the force. And Part T is um, this big old great black fireman who's just he, he carries he carries the the station on his shoulders a lot of times, and he can cook up a storm. He is a native uh, uh, low country um, person who is uh, has been there, has been through all the strife and still carries some of the scars and, and, and you, can feel, you can feel it in him and you can see it in him, but he's a great, great guy and, and he's the kind of person that, um, that Peck depends on to always be there and, and Peck is very loyal to him. And so they, Peck and Partee have been out all day, all, all morning uh, in the marsh getting clams and they've been out to the back country uh, where the, they, where Parti knows this guy who slaughters hogs, and they've cut all these ribs and stuff, and they're all headed back to this great um, party, this low country boil and barbecue rib birthday party that the the fire station is putting on for Peck. And Peck doesn't really care that they're doing it, but they're going to do it, so he's going to eat. Parti is some kind of barbecue man, a magician with hickory. He could make an old shoe taste good if you give him enough hickory chips and charcoal. I swear to God, the ribs we bought from Pac-Man melt off the bone, sweet and juicy, heaven in your mouth. I almost cry when I eat that first bite. It's been so long since I had a good meal that it's almost criminal how good this tastes. I eat potato salad and baked beans, Texas toast, homemade fruit salad that Lori has whipped up from her mama's recipe. I'm so full from ribs and beer and beans that I nearly forget the boil the boys from the Surfside have been washing for partee. But I find a way to get that down too the sausage and corn, shrimp and crab, baby potatoes. Teddy brings out the birthday cake with 35 candles burning hot, compliments of his wife, Mo, who, of course, is not here. She's never around for these kind of parties either, but I imagine it has nothing to do with who's on vacation on the beach. Teddy just never tells her, never invites her. 
Strachan heads back over to the surf side after the food is eaten, and when the music starts to repeat itself, when the last sparks of the party seem ready to be extinguished, someone suggests we go surfing, and the spirit is revived. I ask Parti to go with us, to stop working for a while and enjoy himself. He seems reluctant at first until Lori starts pulling him along, tells Parti there's no reason for anyone to sit in an empty station if it's going, off, if it's going to stay offline. When he says yes, we get him a pair of swim trunks out of Teddy's car and then all pile into the, my truck. It's blazing on the road, the whiteness of the light blinding the sun, bubbling tar seams, black scars that crisscross the asphalt. On the way down, Teddy makes me stop so he can buy more beer. I sit down and stow it in the bed of the truck. He changes clothes in the back while I'm still driving. Lori holds a hand across her eyes when he, his exposed butt comes up and lies flat against the window, Teddy's off-key voice singing, I see a bad moon rising. <laughs> Partee's back there shaking his head, probably wishing he'd stayed at the station. It's all crazy and on the edge of being out of control, but we get to the beach and without incident, without losing Teddy from the, back, from the bed of the truck, and for the rest of the afternoon, we are on the water. Teddy coaxes Partee out, gives him a surfing lesson, then lets him use his board for a couple of attempts at riding away. He's awkward in the water, a little unsure of himself, and I think he notices the way people along the strand stare. He's the only black man on a white beach, even though there's no law left that can keep people from coming out here. All that's been gone for a long time, but it takes more than, than changing the law to change people, my, people's minds. Partee's good at keeping to himself. He's had a lifetime to learn. Everybody else just got started. He gives up sooner than Teddy wants him to, but the surface is mostly flat, so I don't blame him. The rest of us wait until a set rises high enough to bring us to life. We point the nose of our boards towards shore, paddle furiously to catch the tender top of a curl, the force downward just enough to push us across the front of the wave. Partee is in the shallows, whistling and whooping it up as, for a brief moment in time, he watches us walk on water. The late afternoon rides along, drops into evening, the waves flattening out for good when the tide changes. We leave the beach and I take Partee back to pick up his Mustang. He ha he's had enough, as have others with children or those who don't care to keep it going. I say goodbye, thank him for all the good food, leave him in the deserted parking lot behind the station as the party rekindles itself, the changing shift from Surfside complaining that they didn't get in on any of the fun. Teddy thinks that's unfair, and so he leads the charge, says they're all expecting me at Maggie's where the beers are free and there's another birthday cake waiting. We roll into Merle's Inlet where Maggie's is already hopping, listening to music, southern rock and roll, Leonard Skinner and the Allman Brothers, ZZ Top and Marshall Tucker, covered by a local band. Teddy has no idea who the boys are on stage, but that doesn't stop him from running up there to sing along with Fire on the Mountain. He jumps around, hogging the microphone, his voice so off-key that we laugh until our stomachs hurt. Beg anyone who can hear us over the ruckus to please stop him before he makes everybody sick. A generous bouncer goes up there, tells him that the band needs to move on, convinces Teddy to jump off the stage. At 11.30, he goes to work. Teddy's so drunk that he can't walk straight. Earlier, he had given me the keys to his car, and I handed them straight to Lori. When he asked me for them back, I pull my pants pockets inside out and lie, tell him that I lost them. Well, God damn it, Peck, he says. I got to go to work in a taxi. <laughs> we all laugh. We want to be there when he drives up to the Horry County Sheriff Department in a cab, <laughs> drunk out of his mind and ready to go out on patrol. He won't make it, but the idea is funny enough that even after a long, long after Teddy is gone, he's still talked about. He remains the life of the party. After another round or two, J.D. leaves. He comes up before he goes and shakes my hand. Happy birthday, old man, he says. I want to tell him he's a hell of a partner. I want him to understand that I think he has magic in his hands when, he comes in to save, when it comes to saving other people's lives. But I'm drunk. You're a pussy for leaving so soon, I say. He smiles at that, kisses me on the cheek. I love you too, chief. He tells Lori to take good care of me, and then J.D.'s gone. Someone says, let's cruise, and I find myself in the back end of a truck flying out through the low country, passing a, passing a joint around. Now, these are firemen, responsible men most of the time, lighting up, whooping and hollering, singing to, into an eight-track music coming out the back window to fill up the bed where I sit with Lori. We end up in some 
field outside Conway where somebody brings out fireworks of all things, air bombs and Roman candles to light up the sky. There's more beer and pot and everybody sings happy birthday again and I get hit on the back more than I want to be hit, hugged and kissed on the cheek by men I stand shoulder to shoulder with when we are told to enter a burning building, our lives put on the line every day. I'm out here in a dried up field in the middle of night, drunk and stoned at the same time, dead tired, and watching grown men act like little boys who snuck out of their houses to party for the first time. It's the best party I can remember, but one that comes to an abrupt end when a deputy shows up threatening arrest if we don't stop with the fireworks and go home. Somebody asked him if he knows Teddy, but that doesn't seem to make, that, makes, that seems to make matters worse. <laughs> He lectures us about small hot spots already burning inland, tells us that they're expecting winds to shift, a bad sign. It looks like we're in big trouble here until Lori steps in. She's over by his car, takes the deputy out, talks the deputy out of doing anything to us, then comes over to the bed of the truck and says, everybody just shut up and leave right now. We're out of there, back on the road, headed home. We don't talk about the fires inland, we just keep our eyes on the sky, scanning for light from growing flames. No one asked how far inland the fires were, but the deputy seemed tired, like he'd been up longer than he should have, watching for foolish behavior like our own. I sniffed the air like a dog, looking for love, finding nothing there but the musty smell of a low tide marsh as we ride into Garden City Beach. There's nothing left of hump day but loose ends and smoldering grills when we pull back into the station. Everyone quickly scatters, talking quietly about the deputy's concerns, worrying what it might mean for all of us if the fires get out of hand. Inland fires and changing winds, which way will they go, is a roll of the dice. Lori gets my truck and drives me home. I can smell her hair even when all the windows are rolled down and we're going 50 miles an hour. I tell her she smells good. She says, that's because I take baths. <laughs> I laugh at that, tell her I take, take them more often, but I hate going home alone. She's quiet like what I've just said is filled with poison. I can feel her turn left onto the sand road leading to the house, even though I have, I have my eyes closed to try and stop the spinning. When we get there, Lori turns the engine off and we sit in the thick air, the marsh silent. Tree frogs chirp in the distance behind the house. Somewhere far off, I hear an owl haunting the dark. Out before us, the marsh is undefined, nothing but a big black hole. God, that was stupid out there tonight, Lori says. Which part, I ask, rubbing my temples, pulling my hand through greasy hair. All of it, she says, but the fireworks were the stupidest thing I've ever seen. We could have started a fire, and then what? <laughs> we're firemen, I tell her. We put it out. <laughs> With what, Peck Johnson, your good looks? We laugh when Lori says this. I didn't think I was that pretty, I say. Well, you are, Lori says, her eyes turned away. But I doubt that would have helped put out fire. For fun, I pull the rearview mirror over to look at my silhouette face, rub my, rub my jaw, the rough stubble reminding me I need to shave. Let's stay out here, I say, and make out all night. Lori rolls her eyes, pulls the keys from the ignition, and opens her door. Not with me, Peck Johnson. You're a married man. She comes around and opens my door like we're going to a prom. I put out my hand to pull her back in, but she slaps it away. Get out, Peck, it's late. When I try to stand, I stumble into her arms. She holds me good, tells me I'm a sight. I don't remember the last time I got this wasted. It's bad and getting worse. We work our way around the house and into the screened-in porch. I can't find my house key, so Lori has to search my pockets, her hands in places that should raise more than an eyebrow, but she isn't embarrassed. I'm too drunk to get into trouble like that. She finds it, keys the lock, and we fall inside. I'm on my knees, Lori about ready to give up when I ask her to stay. The moment is awkward because she can tell I'm serious. I crawl to the couch, pat the cushion for her to sit down next to me, my head spinning so fast it feels like I'm on a tilt a whirl down at the pavilion in Myrtle Beach. You can't drive yourself back tonight, I tell her, just stay, I could use the company. She's like stone when I lean over and kiss her on the lips. Don't know I'm going to do it until it's done. It feels odd kissing Lori like this. I tried to hold her there, keep my balance, but I can't. And when I fall away, the spell is broken. I can't, she says. I can't do it like this, Peck. Do what, I say, the grin pushing at the corners of my mouth. You know what I'm talking about. It's unfair to Cassie, even though 
Even though she's all fucking Clay Taylor and Wall Holler, I saved finishing her sentence with the wrong words. And that's not what I was going to say, Laura tells me. But if you want to know what I think, she stops there, the space abruptly empty when she gets up off the couch. I'll make a pot of coffee. I can hear her in the kitchen finding things, my head spinning the world crazy. I guess you were right then, I say. Right about what, Lori asks from the kitchen. About having a relationship at work. Won't work, no doubt about it. There's nothing from her after that, my words stuck in the air, sarcasm gone sour. Lori busies herself with the coffee, and that's good for both of us. When she's finished, she finds me outside where I've managed to park myself on a bench on the floating dock. We sit there with steaming mugs, saying nothing more, watching the light come back into the marsh. Lori lay, lays her head on my shoulder. I need sleep, Peck. I know you do, I say. I tell her to go on in and take the bed, that I'll sleep on the couch. You don't have to do that, she says. She raises her head to look at me, the offer made with her eyes, that after all the innocent sparring tonight, she's ready to go the distance, give me what Cassie wants. I need to be a good boy scout here, I say. She watches me a bit longer, her hair falling across her face, loose strands that I pull back, my hand brushing against her cheek. I can tell she's thinking about it, holding it there with her eyes until they too give up. You're a good man, Peg Johnson. Lori kisses my cheek, leaves to walk up the yard. I can hear the screen door popping against the frame as she enters the house. When she's gone, I sit alone, watching the marsh come to life, the sun yet to break across the water along the beaches. I close my eyes, imagining that, in bed, that I'm in bed with her, my hands moving across flesh I've never touched before, the draw incredibly strong. I rub my hands through hair that feels wet. I need a bath and a few hours of sleep. I'm beat up, 35 and two days old, too old to be staying up all night and partying like this. When we were surfing earlier in the afternoon, Teddy told me to be glad I wasn't a dog. He said, in dog years, I'd be dead. <laughs> I don't know why, but for some reason that makes me feel a little bit better. Right now, I don't mind being compared to a dog. Thanks. <laughs>